Hello and welcome to The Actor and the Engineer. My name is Paul James. I am the actor. And my name is Josh Knapp. I'm the broadcast engineer. Okay, let me say something first before we even start. Here's the number one requirement for moving on with this podcast with you. If you suggest a movie, we have to talk about it in, in less than seven days. You cannot suggest a movie and then make me wait, regardless of it being my life circumstance, your life circumstance, your work, my, my work. It, there cannot be any lapse of time if we're going to watch movies like The Square. Oh, because I need to talk about it and I can't wait however long it's been since you recommended it and we are now starting to talk about it. So yeah. from this point on, if it's a challenging movie, which we need to get you in therapy and figure out <laughs> why your taste in movies is so intense because it is in completely contradictive to who you are as a person, these movies that you recommend. So that said, I'm not going to hold you to that because life has treated us very interesting lately when it comes to the podcast. We can't technically get to it. Yeah. Nobody's fault. Just life, liberty, and the pursuit of just surviving. Okay? I get that. I'm not going to hold you to the seven days, but I'm telling you, <laughs> if you recommend another movie like this without being able to talk about it, I, I, I might have to quit the podcast. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> that, for tough. me, that just gave me more time to watch it again. So that was good for me. And then I also scarred myself by watching Force Majeure two nights ago. So that's a whole nother thing. But I started watching it right after watching this, uh, the square. Okay. Yeah, I'm only a half an hour into it and I, I, I have put it to the side. Yeah. But I was, I watched the trailer and I was like, I have to now. I have to. It gets worse slash better. <sighs> Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, let's get into it because I okay. have a lot of questions. So as Paul said, we're talking about the Ruben Ostlin film, The Square, from 2017. It won the Palme d'Or. We were mm -hmm. doing a podcast in 2017. Why didn't we look at this movie? That is my question mm -hmm. to you because we usually kind of have our ears to the ground on stuff like that. It was nominated for the Academy Award for, for Best Foreign Film or, or Best... What were they calling it in 2017? Uh, foreign language film. Best now it's international. Film. Yeah, now it's international feature. Gotcha. Okay, so best foreign language film, and so yeah, I mean the and it ended up losing to a Fantastic Woman, which is another movie that I need to see. And back in 2017, I remember seeing the image that you see most of the time when you like look up this movie is a guy standing on a table looking menacing and a bunch of people underneath him just at this dinner table in this really fancy ballroom. So that right there just made me like, ooh, okay, this is interesting. And then when you start watching this movie, this Ruben Ostlin movie, it doesn't have anything to do with that really. And then so you kind of have to work your way into this film and figure out where this film's coming from. And the movie is made in such a meticulous manner. And it has a lot of questions, but it doesn't necessarily have any answers. And that also interests me because it's kind of a jumping off point, in my opinion. It's a jumping off point for people to talk. This is the perfect movie to watch and then go have coffee afterwards or go have pie afterwards or whatever and, and talk about because there's so much stuff to talk about in this film. So I need for you to just think about that statement you just made for just a split second. Go see this film and then go eat pie. That is a perfect sum total of who you are as a person. <laughs> You're the pie and the movie is the movie. Like they're just in contradiction. So I have a question and I think it was psychological protection that kept me from this movie back in 2017. Mm. I'm just saying that's probably why it, you know, came and went and I didn't. And I didn't, I did, I, I do remember it, but for whatever reason, I never got around to it. What is it about this movie? Is it everything you just said that is the reason why you said to me, you said, you got to see this movie. And you don't say that that often. Mm -hmm. You usually say, hey, have you seen this? You should check this out. Let's talk about this. This one, you were like, oh, the square, you've got to see this movie. And I think you said it a couple of times. So what was the reason or some of the reasons why you wanted to talk about this movie? It, well, I think the biggest the biggest thing that I got from it, apart from all of the the points that the movie is trying to bring up, is how the film is made, how the the creative forces behind the movie, led by Ruben Ostlin, presented the information to the audience, 
And we have, we talk about this all the time. There's a film vocabulary and we're used to that film vocabulary. If there's two people talking, if it's a dialogue scene, or you can kind of expect the, especially kind of boilerplate films nowadays, you can kind of expect what the next shot is going to be or how you set up, like how you set up a, a scene, how you finish a scene and then what goes on within that scene as far as like starting wide and then moving in close and then the camera dollying in a certain way or the camera following action but from the very first shot of this film the very first shot is you see the the main character played by Kleiss Bang I don't really know how to say his name properly but that's what I'm going to go with uh you is see it the main Kleiss Kleiss I think it's Kleiss C L A E S and uh, he, he plays a character named Christian, and he's the curator of an art museum. And he's just laying on a, on a couch. Somebody comes in the, the room, and, you, and Steph was started to watch this film with me, and then she <laughs> lost interest after about 20 minutes. And, and, so she, and so this lady comes into the room, and all you see is like, you know, it's, it's Muppet Babies time. That's what she said. She's like, what is this, Muppet Babies? Where you just see... The, her from her knees down and she's talking back and forth with him you never the camera never acknowledges her as a character never shows her as as a, a person that is in the center of the frame or anything like that we just stick on the the main character and the camera doesn't it like it literally doesn't pay any credence to her it doesn't make any attempt to to change our point of view so there's multiple times throughout the film where not only a camera shot but just plot points in the film are purposefully withheld from the audience. And that's what I loved so much about this. And it really drove home the point to me that good filmmaking can be solely based on, and, and a lot of it probably is based on withholding information from the audience. And, and every time you set up a shot, every time a, a cinematographer, a director sets up a shot, they're purposefully removing information from the audience. So if you're, you know, it doesn't really matter what you're shooting. If you're shooting a baseball field, you know, you, you can either show the field or you can show the stands, but you don't normally, aren't normally going to be able to show both. But you're purposeful in, in what you're showing. And, and that's, that's either character driven, most of the time I'm sure it's character driven, or it's, it, there's an emotional reason why you're doing that. But in this film, he makes such purposeful choices with where he puts the camera and how he moves the camera or doesn't move the camera that it forces the audience to either confront something that they don't want to confront or to focus on something that they probably wouldn't have focused on in a more conventional film that would have a like an easier back and forth b between two characters doing dialogue or whatever and and there's multiple scenes that that bring that into full relief but that was the biggest thing to me is how the camera is used by the these artists to get us into this film and to to connect us to these characters when in a lot of ways it's difficult to connect with with some of the characters so you're saying that when you're when you were talking about your baseball shot you can have the crowd and and or the baseball field, but you can't have both. So the cinematographer, the director, all choose to eliminate certain things in order to get the shot that they want. So they're not trying to fill the frame with something. They're trying to eliminate it until they've got what they want left in the shot. Yes, or they're only showing you what they want to show you. But for example, in that baseball shot, you could show people in the stands and you can show them cheering. But at that point, it, if that's where we're dropped into this scene. We as an audience don't know what they're cheering for. Are they cheering for a baseball game? Are they cheering oh, for a right, football game? It. We right. have no idea. They're just in some outdoor stadium and we have no context. So once you once you turn that camera around and you know give a shot of a batter in the batter's box, you know that they're cheering for a baseball game. So the director, the filmmaker, the writer, whoever, they gave us that information at the time that they wanted to give us that information. We didn't just like know that information. And in this film, there's a lot of times where based on where the camera is placed, we may not know what's going on. For example, there's a there's a boardroom scene close to the very beginning where you see a bunch of people are talking around the table and then you see somebody kind of come in, but the camera doesn't move towards that person 
to show that person coming in. They just kind of come in and go around the background. And then it takes a little while, but you find out that that person is actually carrying a baby. Like he has a baby with him. And, and it, <laughs> this is the other thing is that like, there's probably a lot of cultural stuff, Swedish cultural stuff that is, that is woven into this film that I don't get and that you may not get because we're not steeped in the culture of Sweden. But so th that may have something to do with it. I, um, my guess is that it has something to do with a, you know what, if you need to bring your, your child to this boardroom and, and, you know, while we're doing these important meetings, then it's okay. And it's like, I totally get that. But then at the same time, it's definitely a distraction. And there's definitely, you know, awkward scenes in there where the baby's binky falls and he's like, oh, well, hey, I'm going to treat you as an adult because you are in this boardroom with these professional adults that I'm sure are making way more than I will ever make. Uh, and so, you know, they're just, it, that, that just, to me, it just reeks of a kind of a cultural thing there, but, but it's also awkwardness. And, and so the awkwardness of not showing the character coming in the room and then finally establishing that, you know, by the character sitting down, what this portion of the scene is about, the camera is not doing any of that work for us. We are doing that work and, and the blocking of the actors are doing that work. And that happens time and time and time again in this film. There's so many times when there's, when the camera's like really far away. Another scene is, is you see the camera's inside his Tesla. He goes into the 7-Eleven, which is the most immaculate 7-Eleven I've ever seen in my life. And he goes in, you, you don't hear any dialogue. All you see is like him way, way far away. And, and the screen real estate that is taken up is maybe 10% of the screen of the action of that scene. We don't see any dialogue. We only see him very, very small interacting with another person, him walking back to the car. He gets out of the car for a certain reason and then goes back out and then he comes back into the car. And that the, all the camera's done is just like panned. That's all it's done. It hasn't zoomed in. It hasn't reframed itself. The, and, and those choices are there for a reason. And it's not because he's a lazy filmmaker. It's because it's keeping us kind of separate and it's, and it's allowing us to see a whole scene play out without keeping us right on top of him. And we don't even need to know what those people say in there. We know exactly what those people are saying to him. We know what he's thinking and we know all of the actions and why he's doing those actions and why he's doing them when he's doing them. This film is stripping down as much as it can, but still getting these character beats across and still getting the, the plot across. And I think it's, it's amazing. It's putting a lot of stumbling blocks in front of you and just like jumping over each one. It's really cool. Yeah. I, I noticed all that. So I'm kind of proud of myself. I'm like, yeah, I saw that. I actually think that the baby is not as literal as that. It has to be something deeper. Mm -hmm. This movie has to be, or I have a theory about how it's not at all. And I'll get to that in a little bit. The baby is not necessarily to show for me it's it wasn't that we're showing this free society thing where you can bring your baby to work because we believe in like infants being with their parents and you know we don't believe in the nine to five work uh rat race and that you don't see your kids all day you bring your kids i don't think i think there are so many scenes where there is something outside of the main motion that is distracting it we mm. see that later on when you're seeing the interview with Dominic West and there's a distraction in the audience. Yep. Um, there, uh, and there, <laughs> Elizabeth Moss, how great is she? <laughs> she is great. Like she's so, she just so on point there. She just, her moments, she, she understood the assignment. She's in barely two scenes of this movie and she has a major impact. But during that scene, um, well, the uh, confrontational scene, which we'll get to eventually yeah. with the chairs and the artwork behind mm. them and then the person watching the whole entire time that scene's going on, those chairs are shaking. They're working on something upstairs or downstairs because mm. when the noise, when the noise bangs, they look both up and down. So yep. you don't even know where the, the possible construction or whatever it is, is happening. There's a distraction in almost every single scene. And if I had to put a label on it, or I had to analyze it, I would say that if we're talking about art and we're talking about movies and we're talking about today's society, we're distracted from all of that stuff for obvious reasons, because of our lives, because of our phones, because of uh, Netflix, whatever it may be, we're distracted from what's actually in front of us. And when you're in a museum and you're looking at art, you can't be distracted by anything. You have to be focused on that piece of 
work in order to absorb it or whatever you're going to get from it or whatever you're going to feel from it. But it's constantly, it is all the time in this movie. There's like small little distractions, which is very challenging as an audience member because I was being pulled in a thousand different directions. And I'm not saying this was a bad thing. I'm saying it was a good thing, actually. So I'm wondering why we have the scene with Elizabeth Moss and the character with Elizabeth Moss. And I'm trying to connect the dots of why she's in the movie. And I'm trying to connect the dots of what this means for the greater meaning of the movie. Then I'm distracted by all the noise. So then I'm like, well, why am I being distracted? Why are they trying to distract me? Why is the screenwriter and filmmakers trying to distract me? Am I not supposed to pay? Does this mean that he's not paying attention to her really, not really listening to her, which he's not, but he is? Is it that she's really off base to even being in this conversation with him? Because I have my feelings about that too. It's just so mind boggling to the point where if I let it, it could shut me down. It mm. could make me turn it off, meaning like psychologically or emotionally. I could probably watch the rest of the film, but so it was fun to be ping ponged back and forth from all of these things. Like why, you know, we'll get right to it. Why spoilers from this point on, let's just say it because there's not very many spoilers in this film per se, but there are things I wouldn't want to know about going into this film. I mean, that's true. Film. Yeah. You could describe a whole scene and it would not, it would not ruin quote unquote ruin the movie because it, it's, I mean, it, depending on certain scenes, but, but really there's like most scenes by themselves don't mean much, but when you put them all together in this particular order, they do start meaning things. Are we sure? Do, Are we sure? Right, I'm well, gonna. I'm, we'll I'm, get I'm posing that. this big question later okay. on. Okay. So spoilers from this point on. So uh, Elizabeth Moss is a journalist who is interviewing Christian about his art and all that other stuff, and they're obviously attracted to each other, and there's obviously energy, and then they hook up, and he goes back to her apartment, and. He's, she goes to the bathroom, typical, typical, typical scene. Everything's typical up to this point. And all of a sudden he's sitting down on the couch and there's a giant. Look at that giant. It's a regular sized chimpanzee. It's pretty big though. I mean, it's like <laughs> from, it's just like a single woman's apartment with just a bedroom. And like, it, I mean, it's not that big of an apartment. I mean, okay. So it's, it's a regular sized chimpanzee, yeah. which is not a small thing. Okay. Sure. And then. Okay, well, maybe I, I'm trying to justify it now. Maybe I'm saying like the, the big effect of all of a sudden you seeing this thing and you're like, okay, what does that mean? And yep. they never, mm, that's the they reason. never speak about you, it. You, you hit the nail on the head. So he is waiting for her to, to get ready for their night together. And this chimpanzee comes in and just goes and nonchalantly sits down on the couch. And then he's like, hey, um... Uh, is he, he kind of like tries to stammer or get it out, but then all she does, she, she does come out or around that time. And then she doesn't necessarily acknowledge the chimpanzee. And then he wants to acknowledge the chimpanzee, but he may feel like that would kind of ruin the mood, quote unquote. And so he just kind of lets it go. So the mood's not ruined just because there's a chimpanzee in See, the house. That's the question. Is the mood ruined Bringing for him? Up? Should the mood be ruined for him? Because I would be super weirded out. And so I don't know, like, is that chimpanzee going to rip my face off? I have no idea. Right. But that also, it primes us. It's a primer for what happens after they have sex, which is the whole transition of the detritus Ugh. of that. And so that right there is, is he in his brain, he's like, I wasn't worried about this, but she has a chimpanzee in the living room. So... I'm kind of worried about this. So that that kind of made him jump to a certain conclusion that, of course, she's able to just be like, I can't believe you would think that I would do something like that. You know, you know what I mean? Well, the fact that you even said that makes me justified in thinking it, because and how do you know that that's what I'm thinking about you? There you go. And why are why do you want it so bad? Exactly. Like, there is absolute that is not a normal courtesy. <laughs> It's just not. So it's just not. I think that the that's what the chimpanzee it kind of it kind of gets us into this mode of like, okay, there's there's something going on here and I need to keep my antenna up. I still find it perplexing because <laughs> it's just there and not explained at all, which is I mean, it obviously ties into a lot of motifs later on. It obviously ties into that dinner scene that you were talking about in the beginning of the podcast yes. with the guy with no shirt and standing on the table. 
So it obviously ties into that. And, and, and I know it ties into deeper themes of because we have thumbs, we were able to hold stuff and then write and create art and all that other stuff. So we have evolved from that to being able to see big dust piles in a room and call it art. To me, it was some kind of statement about from ape to man to artist. But then the question is, have we evolved? Because there's multiple scenes. Right. No, no yeah. doubt. Where, where you see the exact opposite of that. You do have people in a boardroom. You do have people talking about viral marketing. But then you also have people cowering. that They don't realize that there's 150 of them and one of this guy that's jumping on tables and, and terrorizing young women. So it, it's, it's one of those things where, the, and same thing in that scene, the, the dinner scene that we're talking about, where uh, Terry Notary, he was kind of the movement person, and he was in the suits in all of the Planet of the Apes movies. And so he's done a lot of research on primate movement and all that stuff. So it's very well done. But before he comes in, everybody at the dinner is primed with a kind of like a voiceover that explains to them this is this situation, this is scenario. All you have to do is be quiet and then he won't he won't be instigated by you and and without that, they may not have acted the way that they acted. They may have acted the way they acted. I don't know, but but that right there is another instance of giving this particular audience in the movie information and then seeing how they react to that information and to what's what they're being presented with, which is a super scary dude that is acting like an ape because if if it was an ape i think people would have maybe been a lot quicker to jump up and leave or it seemed like somebody everybody felt like there was a human in there who was just doing an act and then even christian the character gets up and is like okay that was good all right we're done and then he gets pushed off. But th this is all based on, th that particular thing was all based on an actual performance artist, Oleg Kulik. And he did very similar things, except he acted like a dog. And he would bite people and he would get all up in their face and he would take it too far. Like he would take it farther than people expected him to take it. And that was part of his art. There was one point where I, I imagined what, what I would do if I was an audience member. And when he actually destroys that dinner setting and breaks the glass, that's when I was like, oh, wait, he's going to take this way. F I like thought he was going to defecate on the floor or something. I thought he was really going to go far, um, which he, he does. did. Right. I would have assumed if I was in the audience that the, the woman... And some of the other people were part of it too. Oh yeah. Plants. Yeah. Right. Because at first I was like, is she part of it? And then I was like, no, she's legitimately scared, but is she legitimately scared? Cause she's an actress being legitimately scared or is she legitimately scared? And the only way you really know that she's legitimately scared is because they stand up for her eventually. You know, the crowd kind of like takes over. Okay, here's the other thing about that. You said, you're right, the, the crowd does eventually take over. But once again, this is Ruben Ostlin only giving us the information that he wants to give us and nothing more. When we cut, when that scene ends, they, these guys, multiple people, five guys are actively beating up that guy, that artist, that performance artist. That, I mean, they are physically harming him and it just cuts. And so we don't know how that ends up. We don't know, there's no after, there's no, how did they deal with that? Did anybody sue the museum? Or there's none of that. And, and so it leaves you wondering as an audience member, but it also doesn't give you the satisfaction of either seeing the guy getting beat up, if, if that's what you're feeling in that moment as an audience member, or understanding the, what happens to those people after they realize that that they were, you know, beating up on on this guy. And so like we don't get any of that catharsis. Yeah, be, because it's insignificant. It's insignificant to at least it was to me in the fact that what I took from it was that art sometimes a lot of times crosses 
boundaries and takes it too far and people get angry and have response to it. They become more like the ape that he was acting like. Right. Which, which, is, a, which is a crazy, ironic statement for the performance artist to have pulled out in people. But I was thinking about that artist who put the crucifix in the urine and he, you know, people were angry about that. Mm -hmm. And whether or not you agreed or dis disagreed or thought it was sacrilegious, it evoked an emotion in people. Even if it was just like, that's disgusting, regardless of the symbol of the crucifix or whatever it was in his own urine. It's not what those people reacted to. It was the fact that he got a reaction out of them. And their reaction is more telling to themselves than it is to anybody else watching. And it's a really interesting fine line because I think that, do I think that was a smart thing to do? No, I don't. I personally think it's an insult. But I also think he has the right to create that and he should have the safe space to do what he wants to do and no one should be able to tell him he can't do that. But I also have the right to tell him I think that that's blasphemy. I don't personally think it's blasphemy, but I can understand why people do. So he invoked something in me. He's not worried about what I think. He doesn't care that I think it's blasphemy. He just knew on some level, something got into his mind about this imagery of and it's, I think it's in a jar and the picture is the photograph. It's a photograph. And I think the photograph is taken so you can't see the jar. You can just see the liquid and the crucifix. And so you just don't know that it's just a jar or whatever it is. So he invoked an emotion and that's what his job was. So how I react to it, it's not relevant. So knowing what happened after that scene, whether or not the museum was sued, whether or not the actor or performing performance artist was sued, whatever. It doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to watch somebody act like an ape and then attack a woman, and then you get so violently upset by it, because I was never, sh I, I don't know if I would ever like go to her defense because I, I would never know whether or not it was for real or not, you know? Well, and then also, if somebody did also, that to my wife, I would go to her defense. But then the question is, where do you stop? But you know her personally, you know, she's not an actress. You know, well, you would also have been the person who helped in the beginning and gotten robbed too. You would have been the person who. Yeah, that's a great scene. This is another. Yeah, it is a great scene. And this movie is filled with misdirection. It's filled with it. So it's not that those people robbed him. That's interesting. It's not the act of what they did. It's how he reacted to it and how his life was altered by his reaction to it. And I think that's what art is. Art is about the eye of the beholder, mm. but the artist is not waiting for you to react to it. That's not why the artist did what he did or she did. The performance artist didn't come out there to watch your reaction. They came out there to invoke an emotion and a feeling. But that seems like something that you would, would want as, a, as an audience member. You want to figure out like where they, where they stopped, you know, but well, you know, I was not thinking about any of that. <laughs> what I was thinking about was where is Christian? What's he doing during this? Mm -hmm. Why is Dominic West so sensitive? Well, he's never been challenged like that before. Yeah, well. He's yeah, always been the big go. man in the room, and now he's yeah. been put in his place by this guy acting right. like an ape. So that, right. that says a lot about that character, too. And even the way that he acted in the... I mean, he's only in two scenes also. And the way that, that Dominic West acted in the Tourette's scene, which I grew up... One of my good friends had Tourette, uh, and mm. he... He would grunt a lot. He wouldn't, I mean, I, I even went to some Tourette's conferences and yeah, it was, it was interesting because there were all kinds of different people. There were people that did cuss and, you know, kids, 10 year old, 12 year old kids that would cuss and, and yell and, and all kinds of stuff. But everybody was cool with it. Everybody was like super cool with it. And that, that was, was really neat to see. But in this particular case, it's doing that whole juxtaposing thing of the, the very proper and you know these are the rules we follow in this scenario and then somebody just breaking those rules and then purposely putting us in that uncomfortable position and allowing us to determine what our reaction is to that very much like exactly what you're talking about with with yep. these artists and and that whole interaction is is could also be considered another you know the those clash of cultures of the the upper crust and the debased 
cultures, even though everyone in that room is is just as equal as the other person. And the guy who who saw who had Tourette's, who saw the the art installation, might have even really enjoyed it. And and in fact, I think his wife did say something about that. You know, it's like you know he enjoyed it. He just has a condition, and it also makes you think as an audience member, like what would I do in this scenario? How would I deal with this? And so it's once again, it's a it's a safe way to to do these thought experiments and to where if you do experience someone with Tourette's or at the very least now you know that there are people out there who may have conditions that don't allow them to control guttural noises or what they say or or motions or things like that that that's a possibility so you need to at least put that in your quiver of possibilities when interacting with people to not just automatically jump on them and be like, what the hell's going on? Uh, you got to be somewhat sensitive to to people. And there's an underlying theme in this whole film that, that it, the film's peppered with. Uh, I mean, you see this, these like clean, expensive, amazing areas to, to Sweden, but then you see all these homeless people uh, on the street and, and, it, and we haven't even talked about the score, which is amazing. And it, it's mainly found pieces of, of music and the biggest one that they use is the ave maria with bobby mcferrin and yo-yo ma which is great and they use that multiple times and i love that it's it's a light motif in the same way that star wars does a light motif whenever you hear leia's theme or whenever you hear the imperial march and empire strikes back so so it it brings that in uh at, at particular moments throughout the film and and allows you to connect with that piece well i think the big the big thing that kind of like made me fall in love with this film is that we get all these scenes we've talked about so far and even the scene where uh where you see uh christians confronted by elizabeth moss's character after their night out and at this at the beginning of that scene he's he's on his phone and once again it's it's a big wide shot and they're both kind of really small in the center of the frame and then they start talking and then once they kind of square off you know him him talking to her directly and then he turns around there's a whole scene and and there's even a scene before that where we see those stairs the big stairs where he, he talks mm. and there's all kinds of stuff going on there. That's a whole, there's so many pieces. We're not gonna be able to talk about all the pieces, but anyway, so we know f- physically as an audience, we know ge- geographically as an audience, like where this is in the museum. And so we're like, oh yeah, those are those stairs. And he's talking to her. But then right when it starts to get contentious, when their back and forth starts to get contentious, we get the, the shot reverse shot of her looking at him. But then when he looks at her, the camera is is placed behind him looking at her. And then we see the, this huge sculpture of all these chairs that we've never seen before. It's like that was there the whole time. And there was already multiple lines of dialogue between them. And then now all of a sudden we're confronted with this big, huge mess of chaotic cheeriness. And so it's it's just like that right there is is like, whoa, I didn't even know this existed. So that's that's him giving us even more information. And then, of course, like you said earlier, it, it, there's something's going on above that we don't see. And neither one of them are really like acknowledging it once again. They're not acknowledging the, that, that that is going on. And then kind of no, more they do. Toward, towards the end, they do. But they're trying yeah, to like they do get through it. It struck me strange because like I said in the beginning of the podcast, they look up and down. Like they look at the noise one time and they look up yeah. like the noise is coming from above them. And then... But it sounds like it's coming from down below them at one point or behind them, yeah. behind him that you never see yeah. fully. But Christian is more worried about her talking loud enough so that the docent hears what they're talking about than whatever's going on over there in his museum that if something catastrophic happened, he would have to deal with it. Then the other thing that happens is they have to pause that conversation because his second in command or whatever, you know, another person who works at the museum comes up and, and tells him that somebody <laughs> vacuumed up the, one of the piles oh, yeah. of dirt or a portion of the piles of dirt. But that right there ties into the other scene that he has with her at the very beginning when he does talk about her handbag being on the floor. He's like, if your handbag is on the floor, then is that art? And then it's like, hmm, okay, well, probably not because Bumi didn't put it there purposefully with an artistic purpose. But then the, right next to them are those piles of dirt. And what he is proposing is that they go downstairs and modify those piles of dirt. So those piles of dirt for him have now stopped becoming art because he's willing 
to take that artist's artistic vision and modify it and still call it the same thing. So that to me is, those are pairs, that first scene and then this scene of him saying that they're just going to fix it themselves. Those are pairs right there. So he's kind of like trying to be all fancy and high-minded and say that like, well, this is art and that's not art. And then later on, he's like, you know what? Practically, it doesn't really matter. It's just piles of dirt. So we'll we'll get it taken care of. And, and so that kind of like takes the veil down of all of this you know, it, the the fact that the only reason that people pay so much money for art is because other people may want that art and may be willing to pay the same amount or a, a little bit less for, for that art. And that's why these people want this art. The only reason art is worth money is because people are willing to pay money for art. But art can still be art and not have any monetary value associated with it. But his whole premise at the beginning of the film is we need to spend a bunch of money on art so that all these people can enjoy this art because this is what art is. And all the rich people are going to get the art if we don't spend a bunch of money to steal some of the art from the rich people. It's fascinating because I can't, I almost can't take it all in. I almost can't keep my mind clear about what my thoughts are of this film because it, there's just so much in those two scenes with Elizabeth Moss, enough to take up an hour and 15 minute podcast. Mm. So it's hard to like really dig in. Like where do we go from here? <laughs> right. Well, not 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 necessarily that, but like the piles of dirt, um, which I almost feel bad about calling them that because that's obviously an installation and that's obviously somebody's it art. It can still be so art. What, yeah, it's still piles yeah, of dirt, yeah, though. Right. I think it's a statement about how it's not necessarily about money. Uh, art is valued when people put money on it or want to buy things, and that's what gives it value, and that's why people uh, use money to get it. It's about when somebody walks around, because there are two scenes with people walking around the corner looking at that installation. Mm -hmm. Two people walk around, look, and they're like, okay, and then they turn right back around. Then another guy walks around the corner much later on and then looks, but he's there for a longer period of time. To me, that shows me that the first two people weren't affected by it. They're like, uh, they're piles of dirt. The second person was like, whoa, what is that? He saw something, so he had to take a picture of it. We kind of get this idea of who he is as uh as a boss as a well because there, we haven't even talked about the ransom letter scene and all that but uh we uh get who he is as a boss who he is as uh, a man how he interacts with women and then he, he goes home to his apartment his really really nice apartment and or condo or whatever it is uh and then we find out that you know somebody's trying to like bust in his door and then we find out an hour and a half into the movie, this is an hour and a half into the movie, we find out that he has two daughters mm. and that he's divorced. And that is a huge piece of information that was withheld from us for most of the movie. And I have not seen that done before. And that right there was when I just kind of locked in and I was like, okay, this this is big. Like it, it, it makes everything that happened over the last hour and a half it makes you want to rethink all of that and be like, does this change how I think about how he interacts with women? The things that he's done as far as like how he's reacted to getting his phone stolen and all that. It's like he's he's now, the character is now a different thing. The character is now a father. And so that is a different thing. And then he, him being a father plays a huge role in the rest of the movie in how he interacts with the kid who was mad that he, I mean, it's, it's, it's the whole butterfly effect, unintended consequences, that whole thing. You know, you feel like you've closed the book of, I got my wallet back, I got my phone back, and then a whole trove of books just opened up. And now we have to deal with all of this stuff. And the fact that not only are we as an audience observing how he's interacting with that kid, his children are observing how he's interacting with that kid. And that means even more. So all, all of that. And the way that the camera, the, the camera is literally on a tripod and all it does is just pan back and forth. But the way that the mirrors are in that place and how it's, there's corners and there's all kinds of stuff going on, but it allows the camera to, to move and it di disorients you as to where you are in the, the flat or in, in the condo. And so you kind of get an idea of where you're at, but there's really, there's definitely no handheld in this movie, but there are dolly moves um, when he gets his 
phone stolen at the beginning. There's that, that's a dolly move. And, and there's a couple other uh, moves in, in the film, but it's very minimal. It's mostly locked down cameras and panning and it works. It's, it's great. And it's very photographic when a camera doesn't move. It allows you to, to experience the frame as a still image and composition means a lot more when your camera doesn't move. Well, you know, uh, I've heard a lot of theater directors talk about composition and how they're actually painting live pictures Mm. and that they want you purposely on that side of the couch and purposely on the other side of the couch and then on this side of the coffee table and on that side of that chair purposefully to set once the action happens and then the the conflict happens and you all end up in this uh, composed shot that Mm. at the end of the scene, you're all in these positions and all those positions mean something. You know, if you're upstage, downstage, depending on your position in in, in the scene or your position of the person in the play, whatever it may be. And one director once said to me that you could take photographs of a play and take like every five minutes, take a photograph. And you could actually look at those photographs and tell what was going on in the actual play without Mm. any words and not knowing anything about the play. And I think that he's correct because I've looked at a lot of photo shots of plays that I've been in and other plays that friends of mine have been in. Uh, You do a bunch of publicity shots. You do a bunch of, when I worked in Raleigh, they actually had a whole rehearsal where the photographer was in the balcony and she took pictures. She did it every five minutes. And if you look at them, and I mean, it has a lot to do with, I know what's going on, but Mm -hmm. you can see there is actually, you know, a composite to each photograph that the director set up. And I remember him saying certain things that when you see it in a photograph, you're like, oh, that's what he was doing. Oh, okay. Because you're, no, you're in it. You're not seeing the full thing. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, I, I think that a still shot, like you were saying, is important. And there's a lot of mirrors in this film. Yep. Um, lots, and they're in weird positions. They're either rectangularly really long or they're at the bottom of a wall. It, they're all in weird positions. And then, of course, a lot of stairs. All there are are stairs in this film. Mm. Like, uh, you know, the stairs that you were talking about in the museum. And then, of course, the rotating staircase that you go up uh, and go down. That made me a little nauseous, by the way. Oh, wow. That shot it's is such crazy. a good shot. But it's two It's two different staircases. It's he, When he and his children walk up their stairs, it's the same shot. And it's them walking up there, which are much wider. And then, of course, it's close to the end. He goes up to the flat, walking up the stairs with his kids. Uh, and and you see him go up. It is you're right. It is so tight. You can tell when he walks up those stairs. He only puts his hand on the railing once before. It's like three steps. So it's mm. uh, re- even though it looks bigger because you've got a wide angle lens, but that thing is rotating a lot, and mm-hmm. it is it it is very vertigo like where you're just kind of like whoa. It's it's kind of hip hypnotic, and and you it also gives you you can tell that these are not the stairs that he's used to. He's used to much larger, wider, more luxurious stairs. Fascinating. Okay, so since we're there, um, and we've talked about his kid and the other kid, the question is, is that kid real? That kid's a real person, right? Yeah. He really exists. Okay, so then what happens to him? I At this point in the film, you know that not everything you see, hear, and experience in this film is literal. You know that. Mm-hmm at this point. So is that him screaming out help? Is the, did he fall back and hurt himself? You're right. It is a film of what the, the director decided not to show us. You're exactly right. Because you don't know, you don't know nothing about what happened to that kid. That's right. And you just hear like a little ghost voice. And and it's it's very repetitive. It's two, it's two phrases and it's like, help, help me. But it, the way that he says it, the way that he says help, and the way that he says help me, it's repeated. So I know that in the movie, they just took the, the little kid saying, help, help me, and they just repeated it over and over and over and over again. They, it, they didn't have the kid saying like, help, help me, uh, my leg's broken, I really need some help, oh my gosh, I can't find my family. It, it was help, help me 50 times. And it was the same exact audio clip in the movie. I know it was. So is is the kid a representation of the homeless problem that you see throughout the film that we are willing to 
give money every once in a while and we're willing to have benefits and we're willing to volunteer and do stuff to help society but yet we walk over those people every day. Yeah, there's a remove. Yeah, there's there's like a separation. Yeah. So w- yeah. once he realized that the kid was no longer an issue, which the kid really isn't that big of an oh. issue. I mean, what he's going to go tell his parents that, I mean, what is he? And the specific way that that line is written that he says, the the way that that line is written is very strange when the kid says, um, I will make chaos with you. Yes, yes. That's strange, but that he also I will make ca- there's chaos yeah, with you with you. But that's, that's but I odd. think that there's also uh, there is a there's either a dialect issue or I I don't know. I think maybe the Christian character may be Danish, even though I don't know. It's very difficult because there's there's one scene in there where somebody says to him like, uh, "You sound way too Swedish," or "You you're you're being too Swedish," or something. And then there's another there's that other scene where he's in the when the, where the chaos kid is in the Seven Eleven and he's talking to Christian's assistant who went in there to pick up the package and he said, "Why is it this guy acting like he can't understand me?" And and so there may there's either a dialect issue or a vocabulary separation between the main character. Isn't that a representation of um, class? Him being, yeah, class. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that you yeah. know the, the young kid might not be as well educated or he might have some kind of street lingo that he talks yeah. differently than the upper crust of this museum society. It's mind boggling how many things, that was one of the first things that I wrote down is that and we've talked about this before, in particular with French films, how they have so many subplots in their films. It's almost too much. Mm-hmm. And there are, there are so many in this film. And, yep. you know, you're talking about the assistant, the guy who comes up, his assistant who comes up with the idea of putting the letter in, but he, then yep. he stands his ground and doesn't want to do it himself. Yeah, Michael, I think is his name. In the, in the and movie. the boss is like, I need to know if you're going to step up for me in the future. Yeah. So in order to prove that, you need to do that. And the kid's like, uh, no. So it's an obvious statement about being somebody's supervisor and what you can and cannot ask them for. And it's also a statement about the generation that Christian no longer belongs to. Because Christian started out in the museum at that kid's age, mm. at that young man's age. Just like the two guys who come up with the idea for the promotion of blowing up the little kid yeah. in the square. Which, ironically, Which we haven't we talked, about. talked about at all. I noticed that a half an hour ago. I did. I did I, note it. Maybe we. I thought um, we could get through the whole time without actually explaining what the square is. If you've seen right. the movie, you um, know. You know the phrase. But yeah, I mean, let we can try to tie that in to what we're I talking. Mean, it about. doesn't really matter. It kind of does though, because well, what what the square, what the statement that goes along with that art installation was is the square is a sanctuary of trust and caring. Within it, we all share equal rights and obligations. And that goes right to what you were talking about, how he interacts with people who are in a different class than him, how he interacts with the little kid, how he interacts with the homeless people as far as the lady that when he didn't have his wallet, when he didn't have his cell phone, and he he asked the homeless lady in the 7-Eleven, like, do do you want a a sandwich? And she said, ciabatta chicken, Mm. no onions. And then- Love her. (laughs) And then I love her. He, when he gives it to her, he purposefully gets it with onions and tells her to pick the you onions. You can pick them off. That's right. Yeah. And so that's that little like, and and then he turns right around once he is fulfilled again, once he gets his wallet, once he gets his phone. And when he realizes that the money is still in his wallet, that is now not money that he thought he would have. So he is now willing to give it to her. He's now willing to give her all of the money in his wallet, and he becomes the white knight of her whatever month. Right, because when does the scene happen with the the guy who bows down outside the mall door? That's after. Comes, that's after. All of this is after. all right. this is before we even know he has kids. Right, right. Because these kids go and get lost in the mall. It it has something to do with commercialization and how the art world is commercialized as much as anything else, but they act like they're not, yep. like they're above it or whatever. There are themes of commercialization versus true art. There's themes of be careful what you say in front of your children, they are listening because of the last shot of the mm. film. Obviously, that's a prominent thing. There's themes of 
Be careful how you treat people. It will come back to haunt you. Be careful of what you actually, how you react to somebody because you might need them in the future. There's a Mm -hmm. thousand different themes, almost too many in my opinion. There's the statement about what is the theme about what is too drastic on social media is blowing up a blonde hair. And they specifically say blonde hair, blue eyed little baby is blowing that little baby up in the middle of a square inappropriate and how it, the backlash from that, but actually no uh, press is bad press. Everything is good. You know, is it going to bring more people to the square? Are they going to do more things provocatively explosive? No pun intended. So there's a thousand different themes in this film. I will say this, since we did bring up the square, I'm wondering if it would have been just as interesting to actually create the square for real and by the way they take it from the outside of the museum and then bring it inside the, of the museum which is a statement in itself mm-hmm. but i w- i'm wondering if they actually did that art installation and w- how people would have reacted and put it in the middle of a homeless camp or a place downtown where homeless people gather mm-hmm. or people who have less means gather or whatever it may be and put that square lit up in the middle of that and see what people actually do and do a documentary about that. I think it might be as interesting, if maybe just a little bit more interesting than this actual film, because what would people do? And I don't know if the idea of the square is based on anything else that uh, the director or screenwriter saw yeah. somewhere. And yeah, then it was. Had an, There's and a lot of okay, stuff that's actually like he got his, uh, Ruben Oslin got his phone stolen in the same way that you see in the film. Now, he didn't do all the rest of it, but yeah, he got his phone stolen in that exact same way. And by the way, um, is the guy that he high fives, he's part of it too? He's part of it. Okay, that's what I thought. That's what I see. I'm just just overly skeptical of the world. I remember a lady came up to me in downtown LA and she looked very professional. Top to bottom, very professional. Oh, I'm just, I was downtown for a job interview and it all sounded legit. And then um, my car broke down and my brother's coming to pick up my car, but I still need bus money. Do you have a couple of dollars? And for whatever reason, I just kind of looked down at her shoes and she had ripped up stockings and not great shoes on, but all the way from the top of her head to, to her ankles looked like a professional person who worked downtown. But then I realized this is just her thing and this is her way of getting money. And I actually, I, you know, I'm wondering if people are like spiteful. How dare you try to trick me? I was like, clever. Well done. You deserve this $5. You know, like you made a lot of effort to get this money out of me. You yeah. put it on, you presented it. But unless I fully looked at this person, I would have never seen it. Mm-hmm. I just would have seen what she wanted me to see. And I think that's somewhat of what the square is trying to develop with its ideas that if you do stand in here, it's a safe space and all that other stuff. So I'm wondering if a documentary might not be Hmm. interesting. I'm sure it would, especially if you put it in different places throughout the, the city, you know, if you put it in a high class, high society, high brow Mm -hmm. is the word you used earlier. What would happen? Would they be less kind, more kind? Would they be superficial? Would they act? like they are supposedly acting kind what would happen so well i mean it happens a, a it question. happens today really when you think about it as far as like amazon packages and 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 right. anything like right. that so i mean yeah there there are certain places in in certain cities where people wouldn't dream of leaving amazon packages on their front porch and then there's other places where it's totally fine the other thing is is that the square is a bound area and i think that maybe they're trying to to point out that really there's no reason for that area to be bound and for there to be special rules within that, that the square should be encompassing all of society, but it doesn't. And, and everybody seems to be okay with that, uh, it, at least on a, on a surface level. So that's a whole nother, <laughs> whole nother thing, but you could spend the, the whole podcast has been a whole nother. Yeah. We brought up a subject and then we can spend a whole nother it's the worst. podcast talking about. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's, it's great. It's provocative. It's, yeah. it's exactly what an artist wants to do. Okay. So if we're coming to the end, yeah. I do want to, here's what it dawned on me. And I, 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 I don't know, there might be some, something to it. Okay. So are we sure that this filmmaker 
purposely did certain things that he thought was art or is the whole film the purse, the handbag? The theory is if you take your handbag and put it in the corner of this museum and call it art, people will look at it differently and say it's art. But really, it's only your handbag that I literally just took off of you right now. It's just a handbag. But we read stuff into it and we make it art because art is in the eye of the beholder. Is this whole film a handbag? Mm. I like, got the opposite of that first scene. I got him telling her that her handbag is definitely not art because there's no meaning behind it. Right. But if we put it in the corner and put a little tag on it that says leather bound purse made out of blah, 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 created and blah, 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 mm -hmm. artist, blah, 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 circa, blah, blah, blah. If we did that, would it now be art? Because the museum is telling you it's art. Yeah, of course. That's what he's saying to yeah. the journalist. Yeah. That it has to have a, a, a meaning and it has to have an emotional through line that the artist wanted something to come out of it, mm -hmm. right? A lot of modern art is hard to define because it's a big splotch of blue and a big splotch of red. You're like, what? And then you realize that this means that and this means that. You know, you might get an emotional reaction to it. You might have a feeling from it, but you don't know exactly what the artist wanted from it. And sometimes those little plaques explain what the artist was thinking and why they're using this particular uh, medium, ash or coal or corks uh, of wine bottles burnt. I mean, I've seen a whole bunch of different things, mm -hmm. all of which those three types of things were used. So is it art if we put it in a museum and say it's art or is it art because the artist created something to get something out of you? And how do you know the difference? I think that's the key is that the artist created it to get something out of you. Here's an example. Just last week, an artist named Jens Hanning, he was paid $84,000 by the Kunsten Museum of Modern Art in Denmark to create two pieces of art. He then took that money and then sent them back two blank canvases. And those two canvases are now being displayed in the Museum of Modern Art. The piece is called Take the Money and Run. So, those pieces of art, those blank canvases that he did not touch with a brush or a pencil or anything like that are on display now and they are generating a reaction from the people that are seeing them and even the people that are and hearing the, about them. It's fascinating. I love everything about that story. There's <laughs> nothing about that I don't love. I love everything about it. That is, I wish I was that ballsy immensely create <laughs> no 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 i'm ballsy like that that uh, ballsy is not a problem with me um but to be that immense in creativity that that's where your mind goes is amazing to me now my mind's pretty creative my mind can go into places that a lot of people don't see it until i show it to them and it's a silly example but i'm decorating for halloween and they have these little flame lights that you can screw into just a regular like Christmas tree candle you put in your window. Well, they're really kind of demonic when they flicker and they're really kind of scary, but I didn't want Christmas candle lights in the window like you have at Christmas time. So I turned them upside down and I put them between the curtain rod and the window and they just hang there. Mm. Now it looks like these flames are suspended in midair hanging upside down. And the very first reaction I got was I would have never thought about that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I know that's a, like, I love that. I thought of that but that's minimal creativity to a degree. How somebody comes up with the idea of taking an $84,000 check and then giving them blank canvases to cause some kind of emotional reaction, controversy, whatever it is, is brilliant in my opinion. So, but by reading that story, you're saying that because of the intention of the artist, that's what makes it art, right? Yes. Okay. Well, what if the intention of the filmmaker was to make you believe there was intention behind the art when there wasn't? And his statement is, we overthink things. And if we feel a certain way, we feel a certain way. But I can manipulate the way that you're going to feel by making you, giving you the perception that you're watching art when you're not doing anything but watching a purse. He's trolling us. Well, that's a very 21st century way of putting it. And that's also kind of like 
I, I, I don't know if he's tr like that has a negative connotation to me. I'm saying, what if the artist flips around the whole, the blank canvas is the perfect <laughs> example of this. This is not a blank canvas. He's got, there's so much, there's so much energy put into this film that it's, it's too much energy. You know how there's people that you may work with that spend all of their time and all of their energy into figuring out how not to do their job? Oh, I hate, oh my gosh. I have said this for decades. If you spent more time just doing your job versus trying to get out of doing your job, we would all be better off. But yes, I know exactly that. And that, they can be the majority of people at work. There you go. So, but that right there, it, it, this does not, I don't see that from Ruben Ostlin and all the people that were employed to make this film. I just do not see that. But it's, I mean, it's an interesting thought experiment. And the cool part is, is that because it's art, you can experience that art in a totally different way than me. And that's something that you can get from this piece, which is, which is really cool. Wow. I just called a film I, a piece. That's interesting. <laughs> well, that's because it, we're talking about art. Yeah. I, I, I think the only criticism I have for people when they go and experience art, especially in a museum, is when they dismiss it because they don't get it. Mm. It's a blue splotch and a red splotch. I don't get it. What is that? That's not art. When people dismiss stuff, that bothers me. But not understanding it for what the artist, artist meant or not understanding your feelings about what you're looking at are all legit to me. To dismiss it and act like, Ugh, I don't understand it, so it, it's not art. You know, a landscape with some dogs playing in a uh, park that's art because you it's it says something the picture says something it has trees and look how realistic they made the dogs that's art uh, okay that's that's the world you live in but well hold on but one person's art can be another person's trash and vice versa absolutely so Abs yeah. but to dismiss somebody's art as trash because you don't understand it is where i think it's complicated and not a very healthy trait. Mm -hmm. If you're not understanding something, then say, I don't understand what the blue and red splotch means. I feel something or I, I feel confusion, but, but to just dismiss it and act like it's not because you don't see it, that bothers me. Mm. So if there is a purse in the corner of a museum or the big piles of dirt, I don't understand what that was, but I was sitting there trying to figure out what does that mean for me and what does the neon sign on the wall mean? You are nothing. Yeah. You are just, you know, a clump of dirt. Ashes the ashes. Mm -hmm. And so I at least extracted something from it. But I was more intrigued by the first two people were like, nope, and just <laughs> walked away. That brought an emotional response to me quicker than trying to figure out what the artwork was. We need to have a bridge that says, hey, it's okay to come and explore this one room in a museum with a bunch of dirt piles in it. It's okay to go in there. You, you, it's okay for you to want to peer around the corner and not understand that. That's okay. But we have in this culture, and I'm standing on my soapbox, we have made that a joke. We have made that a punchline. You know, I, what, I don't go to museums. I can nap at home. You know, like hmm. we've made that not relevant. And I'm not saying that we should be gatekeepers and saying, this is art and that's not art. And this is art. And that's not, you can't watch the Avengers film because that's not art. I'm not saying that. I'm mm. saying that how do we develop a thirst for it? That's something that we're not going to be able to figure out tonight. <laughs> <laughs> As if we were ever going to try. Maybe next time. <laughs> Tune in next time when we figure out art. Okay. So you can check us out on the web at actorandengineer.com. Uh, you can go to facebook.com slash actorandengineer. You can tweet us at actorengineer. And we're also on YouTube. Just search for the Actor and the Engineer podcast. And we'll see you next time. Bye.